Bible is wearing this. It takes a village shirt. Uh, that is in reference to our collegiate ministry. You know, they had over 60 uh, young adults and students gather. What was that, Friday night, Thursday night? Thursday night for a party. And, and God is doing a neat thing. Can we just celebrate that 60 plus college students want to hang out and talk about Jesus? Uh, I, just, I love that. I love that honored to be part of the village that you guys get to call home while you're here. Uh, there's so much happening in so many ways, student ministry. I, I could ramble. I'm not going to. I want to pray. But I just want to give you something to celebrate. What has God done in your week this week? If nothing else, you are here. You woke up with breath in your lungs, with words in your mouth. Can we agree that we're going to use that to give them praise? to give him glory and give him the honor he deserves. Father God, right now, it is in the mighty name of Jesus that we give you our best offering, Lord. We give you our highest praise, Father God. We use our hands, we use our feet, we use our mouth to celebrate you because you are the King of Kings. You are the Lord of Lords. And we glorify you in Jesus' name. Let's go, come on. Somebody raise a shout in this room. Father, we want you to have your way.
Father, we invite you to be seated on the throne of our hearts this morning. Be enthroned, King Jesus, be enthroned on our worship, on our praise, on our adoration, on our love for you. Be enthroned.
Isaiah 61 uh, just keeps wrecking me. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is in this place. Listen, it says, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who grieve in Zion. But listen to this, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. A crown of beauty instead of ashes. He says, the oil of joy he poured the oil of joy on us instead of mourning. Check this out. And a garment of praise. A garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. Your situation is not done yet. You have a garment of praise. This is not the end. You have the garment of praise. The spirit of the Lord is right here in this place. You got his garment on. says they will be called oaks of righteousness well, listen to this a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor a planting of the Lord you've got to realize that this these oak trees take years to actually develop years to actually develop and what it also requires is careful attention of the gardener why would he spend so much time growing us? Why would he spend so much time planting us? Why would he spend so much time just working things out in our lives? Because he loves you. Simply put, because he loves you. I need you to hear this today. If you don't hear anything else I have to say today, he loves you. And he has planted you. He's developing you. He's growing you. He's not forgotten about your situation. He's turning things around for you here in this place. The Spirit of the Lord is right here in this place. Would you respond to Him? Let's take a moment. Let's pray. Just right here. Allow His presence to just sweep over you. Just experience His love for a minute. Mm. Right here. Yep. Let's slow it down just a little bit. Just experience His presence. He planted you. Before you were in your mother's womb, he thought about you. Before you had a chance to make the mistake that you thought ended your life, he thought about you. He's planted you to display his splendor. It's all about him getting glory. And what brings him the greatest glory is you. He says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Mm. Thank you for your presence, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Let's pray together. Thank you, God. Lord, we are so, we're so enamored by your presence, Lord. We are overwhelmed by how good you are. Not for all the things that you've done and not for all the blessings that you give us and not for all of that, Lord, but we are simply overwhelmed because you love us, that you decided to move towards us before we ever had a chance to move towards you. Thank you for your grace, Father. 
Thank you for your grace that we could not earn it. We didn't deserve it, Lord, but you threw it out on us. You lavishly threw it out on us. You lavishly ran to us, pouring out oils of joy on us, giving us your garment of praise. Thank you, God. Thank you. All we have today, all we have today is thank you. Got nothing else but thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you, God. Just right in this moment, just say thank you to God. Just say thank you. I don't know what you had to do to get here, but say thank you to him. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Grab your seats if you can. Man, I am, <laughs> I'm really excited to, <clears throat> I'm really excited to preach here today. Um, you know, I share with uh, Saturday service just, just kind of the, the week I've been having. <clears throat> and uh, it's, been, it's been one of those weeks. Like, it's like, all right, Lord, what, what are you trying to do? Like, what, what, what's, what's actually going on? My, my family and I, we were driving down to, uh, there's a family I've been praying for, giving some backstory. There's a, a family I was praying for, one of my best friends and his, his wife, they had their daughter at 26 weeks. And, you know, we were nervous that maybe she would not survive. And I've been praying for her, like crying out, praying to the Lord. And, and this baby girl is 33 weeks now. I'm over, I, I'm telling you, like, so today I, I'm going to try, I, I'm some, maybe I might, you know, uh, hold my composure. Shanice told me, don't, don't try to hold it back. Just let it, let it go. So I, I may not hold my composure today, but there's so much to be thankful for. I was on my way to drive and support my, my family down there. And my family, we got actually, we actually broke down on the side of the road uh, in somewhere in a different state, right? And so I'm like, Lord, what am I going to do? Like, here I am, the man of the house, the one who's supposed to have the answers. Like, I need to have the answers, and I'm broke down on the side of the road somewhere. <laughs> and I'm a little scared because these, my, my little girls are in the car. My wife is beside me. And then we get broken down on the road somewhere. And then uh, what's crazy, it's like, okay, fast forward a little bit more. Um, we had this crazy week. My rhythm was thrown off a little bit because Fridays are the days that I usually use to prep my sermons and everything else. Uh, but come to find out, my wife has shingles. And so she needed today to go to the doctors and, and get some things taken care of and get her medication and all these other things. And, and life has just been like thrown at me in so many different ways. But in the midst of all of that, in the midst of all of that, listen to this. We were stranded in, a, in another state. Our car was broke down in another state. But wouldn't you know it that we had a church member, a family member, who actually lived in that exact same state. Her name is Yolanda. She sings on the praise team. And she says, oh, why don't you come to my house instead? Okay. All right, Lord. So we stayed at her house for a couple of days. I had another brother uh, on the phone, Jason Miller. He was, he's like a, a, you know, my resident mechanic, and he's on the phone saying, hey, tell the mechanic this, tell him that. He even got on the phone with the mechanic and said, hey, you need to make sure you're doing the right thing with his car. It's family, right? And then fast forward just a little bit more that even despite all of that, somehow we were reimbursed for the cost that AAA screwed up with. Not to mention that now our bill for this car is already paid for. And, and all I can say today is I am just excited to be in the house of the Lord. I'm just excited to be around family today. I, I got to share this with you too. Our, our pastor is, you know, this guy, he, he's working almost two jobs. I, I won't make the joke of the Jamaican and everything else, but he, he's, he works a, a lot of jobs. And, and one of the jobs, though, is that he's, he's our pastor. And so one of the things, I don't ever want to put more pressure on him, but one of the things that's as I was going through all of this stuff, I'm usually the guy pouring out to others and, and sharing with others. I text Pastor Freddie, and I knew he was in the middle of one of his craziest, uh, crazy week, and I didn't expect a return. But he actually texted me back, and he pastored me. Like my pastor pastored me. I'm just saying I'm excited to be around family. If you came here today and you feel just a little bit lonely, if you came here today and you feel like things are just getting a little pressurized, I just want to say just sit back, relax, and enjoy being with family today. Amen. Enjoy being with family. So I want to welcome you. I want to welcome you. Um, if this is your first time in a, a long time, and your first time in a while, whatever, however you got here, I just want to say welcome. If you're joining us online, welcome. This is family. And, I, and I'm, I'm not just saying that. That's just not something that we say, but it's something that we actually practice. Family. 
And so we've been talking about the last couple of weeks, uh, practices, practices that we as a church actually engage in. And so we, we have this series called This Is How We Do It. And, and I want you to understand that this is not something that we're trying to say is prescriptive, right? Like if you don't do it this way, you're going to some bad place. You're going to hell. You're going here. Like if you don't do it this way, we're, we're taking your membership away. That's not what's happening here. Instead, these are descriptive practices, that these are things that people have been doing throughout centuries. Christians for centuries have been doing this. Jesus practiced this. We as a church, we practice this. And the reason that we practice this is not so we can gain God's approval, but Jesus showed us these practices to say that if you do these things, it'll make your life a little bit more like mine. And if your life is a little bit more like Jesus, he says in John 10.10 that your life will be a lot more fulfilling. And so what we're trying to do uh, today and, and in this series is just to expose some practices, give us all so that we're all on the same page. And so since you're around family, I just want to invite everybody to the table today. I want to invite you to the table to invite you into this, this topic, these topics. And you don't have to know a lot. You, you can be just as confused as I am, but I, I want you to just feel at home, okay? So today we're diving into mission, mission. Okay, a few weeks ago we talked about first series of prayer, we did worship, we did the word, and now we're jumping in to mission. And I'll be honest with you, um, I was a little confused at why they asked me to preach about mission. Like, Pastor Brianna is our outreach pastor. Pa pastor Hannah goes on every mission trip. She loves mission. Me, not so much. So I I'm wondering, like, why did they ask me to talk about mission? Like, I you guys have got to understand just a little bit about me. I am, I'm a, I'm a three on the Enneagram, whatever that means. I I'm an achiever. But I'm also, th this, this thing, I'm really analytical. I like, I need to know what's going on. I have tons of questions about everything. Amen. <laughs> My pastor agreed. <laughs> I question everything. And so I really have a lot of questions when it comes to mission. And two of my questions is, first of all, what is it? And then the other question I always have is, what am I supposed to do? I mean, think about it. I don't know if you ever had that question around mission. What is it? Like, is it mission or missions? Like, does it matter if I put an S at the end of it? Like, does it make it more special? Like, what is it? Is it, like, because I've been around a lot of churches. I'm probably what you'd call a denominational mutt. Like, I don't really fit in most places because I'm not really Baptist, I'm not really Pentecostal, I'm not really Reformed, I'm not really charismatic. Anybody uh, denominational mutton here? <laughs> and every church has a different practice when it comes to mission. So some churches, they focus on just passing out tracts. And I just tell you, I'm not knocking anybody who does that. I actually grew up doing that. I'm just saying it kind of annoys me when I walk into a supermarket or, or a, a grocery store or I walk into a clothing store and I see a $100 bill on the ground. I go to pick it up and say, the Lord has blessed me. Open it up and it's the Romans road to salvation. I, just, I, I don't know if that was Jesus' intent. I don't know. So some, some people pass out tracts. Some people have lifestyle evangelism. Maybe it's, it's, a, it's a, you marry and Martha thing where, hey, just invite people to your home. Maybe it's, you know, just uh, do I need to know the Romans road to salvation? Do I need to know the sinner's prayer? Is mission about foreign mission? Is it only going to third world countries? Can I do mission in uh, this neighborhood? Can I do mission in my neighborhood? Is it only for poor people? Is mission only for poor people? Like, what about the rich people? Is mission only for those who are married? Do we only have a mission for those who are married or those who are single? Like, what about those people in the it's complicated category? Like, what, what's mission for? <laughs> is mission just about screaming? Is it John the Baptist singing or everything? Just screaming out, Jesus is the only way. Everywhere I go, that, that actually happened to me one time. I was on a SEPTA bus in Philadelphia and... <laughs> My friend I grew up with, she had just gotten saved. She was about to walk off the door. She was about to walk off the bus. And as she was leaving the bus, she says, Jesus is the only way. And left me on the bus with everybody else. <laughs> Everybody's looking at me like, that's your girl. <laughs> is it John the Baptist? Do I, do I have to scream out in public? And, and I, we always hear growing up, I heard this all growing up. You know, you are the hands and feet of Jesus. You've got to be the hands and feet of Jesus. We are the hands and feet of of Jesus. And again, I have tons of questions. So my question was, well, can anybody be the arm? 
maybe can somebody be the eyeball? Like, I don't know, did Jesus have neck fat? Like, because if he had neck fat, maybe I'm the neck fat of Jesus. Like, you're not quite sure what it's there for. What, what is it? What is it? <laughs> Mission, what is it, right? But the other question I have is, what am I supposed to do? Like, what am I supposed to do? I've got a wife and three kids. I'm, I, I'm uh, the primary breadwinner, and I'm not saying that to complain, and I'm not saying it to boast. It's to say that the church takes really good care of us, but my situation is that we only have one income. So if mission is only foreign mission, I don't have the money or the margin to do that. Well, well what is it? Like, what am I supposed to do? Is it, is it starting another mission, like, uh, initiative? Is it doing another program? I don't really have the margin to do that. I'm a full-time pastor. I'm a full-time husband, and I'm a full-time father. What, what, what am I supposed to do? And maybe you are feeling the same way I feel. You're on a college scholarship, and you're wondering, what am I supposed to do? You, you, you are a single mom, and you're wondering, like, I don't know if you see my finances yet. I mean, what am I supposed to do? Maybe you're caring for your parents and you're wondering, what am I supposed to do? Maybe you're a teenager in your parents' house and you're wondering, what am I supposed to do? Maybe you're sitting here and you don't even know anything about this whole Jesus thing we've been talking about. And you're thinking, I'm going to try to strong arm you at the end of the service to participate in something. And you're wondering, what am I supposed to do? Right? So what happens is, When I feel a little confused and my questions haven't been answered, when I feel a little bit confused and I don't know what to do and I feel just a a tad bit bit guilty about what I'm supposed to do, I wind up not doing anything at all. And so that's where we are as we open this text, Matthew 28, the Great Commission. This Great Commission, this is the marching orders of of Christians. And, And one of the things that really throws me off, though, is that even though this is the marching orders, it appears as if the disciples are just a tad bit confused on what they're supposed to be doing. They're asking the question, well, what am I supposed to do? Some of the context is that Jesus has just died on the cross and rose again. Now, you've got to understand that that's significant, but these guys had given their life, these followers of Jesus, these disciples of Jesus, they had given their lives to follow Jesus. Peter gave up his fishing business to follow Jesus. Matthew gave up all of his money to follow Jesus. And now Jesus got himself killed on the cross. What am I supposed to do now? These disciples are in this spot of what am I supposed to do? And so let's pick up here. Matthew 28, verse 16. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him. But some doubted. You mean some of the disciples felt like neck fat too? They, they They were confused too? Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Many of the disciples are wondering the same thing that you and I are wondering. What am I supposed to do? And I want to I push on the subject really quick that mission is not about uh, starting another initiative. It's not about handing out another track. It's not about doing another program. Mission is about something more than that. It's actually about moving towards relationships. We want to unpack this text really quick. First of all, I'm just going to try to just keep it really simple for us. We're going to, the format is we're going to talk about why we do mission, why is mission important. We want to talk about what is mission and what is our mission. And finally, we're going to end off on some practical stuff of how do I actually do mission. Okay? Here we go. Why is mission important? Well, you guys see the, the answers on the board here. Um, The reason that mission is so important is we would probably all agree is because the Bible says so, right? Just just really easy. The Bible says so. This is the truth of Scripture, and Scripture is the authoritative word of God. God breathed this Scripture, and now he gave it to us. And so we would all say, yes, the Bible said so. The challenge, though, is that Over time, you and I have been in environments where whatever church you were a part of, whatever small group you were a part of, whatever family you grew up in, we would kind of sprinkle our house seasoning on God's truth. 
And what happens is we begin, to, I, still, I stole this from my pastor, we begin doctrinizing our convictions. And whenever we begin to doctrinize our conviction, even though conviction is really, really good, it starts to come across as condemnation. And if it's coming across as condemnation and this is supposed to be my mission, there's a good chance I'm not going to want to do it because I feel guilty if I don't do it your way. Uh, so yes, this is reason. The Bible says so. That is a, an important reason. It's the truth of Scripture, but it's not the full picture. I want you to understand where we're going here. There's something more. Number one is the Bible says so. Number two is the reason we do mission is because we are responsible for it. Jesus steps on the scene and he says, hey guys, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now you go. It's to say that, hey, this was my mission. I've done my part. I've done the heavy lifting. Now I want you to go and do your part. Now I need you to go and do what, what, I, what I told you to do, essentially. The challenge is, we often realize that the world has needs, and, and then we start to believe that somehow Jesus needs us. He just said that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. That's to say that he doesn't need your approval rating. It's also to say that you don't get a performance grade for going out and doing the mission of God. See, what we have to understand is the key to understanding this mission is to realize that the mission is not ours, but it's Jesus' mission. And this is called the great co-mission because he's invited us to participate, to be co-laborers in the mission that was already set before us. It's not our mission. We are not God's gift to the world. Jesus is. So he says that we're invited to be a part of something more. And so the truth of it is, the Bible says so, the truth is we are responsible for it, but there's something more. You could probably feel it. There's something more. This wasn't just a command. Like Jesus wasn't looking for minions. He wasn't looking for slaves. He wasn't looking for pawns. Jesus was not looking for blind followers in this text. He was looking for relationships. I want you to understand this, that this is a reason that we haven't talked about just yet. Yes, the Bible says so. Yes, we are responsible for it. But there's a third reason. And this is the reason that I want you to leave with. This is the reason that I hope uh, gets in your heart. This is the reason that brought me to church this morning. This is the reason that got me out of bed this morning. This is the reason that I want you to understand. Here's what it is. He chose us. He chose us. Check this out. This scripture was rocking me all day long yesterday. It says, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Listen to this. Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So what he's saying is, I command everything. All the earth belongs to him. All of heaven belongs to him. The angels have to bow down to him. The heavens have to bow down to him. The earth bows down to him. That means that the wind has to obey what he says. That means that the mountain has to bow down to when he says. That means that everything on earth bows down to him. He commands everything. That means that your financial situation has to bow down to him. That means that your marital discord has to bow down to him. That means that addiction that you've been wrestling with has to bow down to him. He commands everything. But it doesn't stop there. Jesus could have commissioned anything. He commands everything, and he could have commissioned anything. He has all authority in heaven and on earth. And so all he had to do to spread his message was to say to the angels, hey, fellas, come and take care of this. Ladies and gentlemen, come, come and take care of this. Spread my message. He could have displayed it on a jumbotron of heaven. Hey, y'all, here's my message. Here you go. He could have given the message to the birds of, of the air to say, hey, guys, spread my message. He could have given that message to a frog. He could have even told the rocks to cry out. He could have told the mountains to cry out. He could have told everything to cry out. But instead of choosing those things, he chose us. I don't know if you've ever been chosen before. I remember my wife on June 7, 2009, when we first got married, and I'm, I'm bawling. I'm just crying because I'm about to walk into this door, and she's about to say, I do, and I'm crying because my wife is beautiful, and she could have been with any other man, 
but she chose me. Right? She chose me. Jesus chose us. Here's how I know. Read this text. We often focus on all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. But we miss verse 18 in the same passage that says, then Jesus came to them. Check that out. They were on a distant mountain. He told them to go there. He could have just displayed it in heaven. He could have just said, hey, guys, I'm going to download this into your head. But instead, he decided to show him, show them his heart. He says, I'm going to come to them. This word came to them is the same word that means draw near. It's the same word we use in James that says, as we draw near to God, he draws near to us. This, he came to you. I need you to understand that Jesus was not obligated to choose you. Jesus wasn't obligated to use you. He didn't have to, but he chose you. Check this out, even with the disciples. He came to them. Many of them were confused. They were stuck. They didn't know what to do next. They didn't know how to operate next. I had, they'd given up their businesses. They'd given up all of their stuff, and now they're in this limbo like, Jesus, what am I supposed to do? And what he did was he came towards them. I need you to understand that, that Jesus came towards you. Before you had the answers, before you knew the Romans road to salvation, before you knew the sinner's prayer, before you said the right words, before you knew all of the scriptures, before you knew any of this stuff, Jesus came towards you. That's the message of the gospel. That's the message of this mission that he teaches us, that he came towards us. So why is mission important? It's because Jesus actually brought the kingdom of heaven towards us. We weren't responsible for it, but he brought it towards us. I want to give you something really quick, some notes if you're, if you're taking, that Jesus was exposing his heart to us. And what was at the heart of God are three things. Three things that have always been at the heart of God. This is his mission. Family relationship, powerful intervention, and effective restoration. You've got to understand this, that at the heart of God, from the beginning, Jesus left heaven so he could bring you back into his family. He wanted to bring you back into the cool of the day. He wanted to bring you back into that walk of intimacy that we once shared with him. But after the fall of man, that relationship became distant. And so Jesus, we see in John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Jesus left the comfort of heaven so that you and I could be brought back into his family. It was powerful intervention. He died, he rose, and then he defeated the powers of sin and death and the grave. What Jesus was saying is you ain't got to live that way no more. You're not under the law anymore. You are now free. I've given you freedom. I want to show you this. Here it is, Ephesians 2. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and your sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us are also, we lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of God's wrath. But I want you to hear this. This is what saved my life. We were deserving of God's wrath, but God. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich and mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. It's by grace you've been saved. Not by what you did. Not by what you know. Not by the track that you passed out. By grace you've been saved. Grace is the release. You don't have to live that way anymore. He's saying, I'm giving you a better way to live. And then effective restoration. If we continue on with Ephesians 2, he said he made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It's by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches expressed in the kindness to us in Christ Jesus. We are seated now in heavenly places. Here's what I want you to understand, that Jesus' mission wasn't to take you back to your former life. It was to restore you to your rightful position. You have authority. 
You are kingdom citizens. You are a kingdom ambassador. And what I need you to understand is that you have a great call on your life. I don't care how old you are here. I don't care how much experience you have here. I don't care how much uh, scriptures you know or don't know. Jesus is saying that I died, I rose again, so that you would realize the powerful position that you have on this earth. Wherever you walk, the kingdom walks. Wherever you walk, healing should be there. Wherever you go, freedom should be there. Wherever you go, forgiveness should be there. Wherever you go, grace should be there. Why is mission important? Because he had the audacity to move heaven towards us. And then he chose us. He chose us to actually do the same for others. I want you to understand that this mission that we are part of is not just, not just a great commandment. It's not just marching orders. It's not just something we should be doing and we feel guilty if we're not doing it. It's not just this command. But Jesus is saying, I'm inviting you into a life that you could never imagine. Come on now. I'm inviting you into be a little bit more like me. Yes. And if you're a little bit more like me, your life's a lot more fulfilling. Woo. What is mission? What is mission? Well, mission is moving his kingdom towards others. Here's how it works. We'll, we'll go through this really quick. The definition of mission is met, metier. This is a Latin word that means to sin. But it also is a Greek word that means it's a verb. It says one who has been sent. And so if we were to kind of, you know, boil this down or put it all together really cute, it would be that mission is movement. Mission is movement. And here's the thing, that we are all moving all the time. But what are we moving towards? What are we moving towards? And so in this passage, Jesus is giving us an example. He's telling us, he's demonstrating to us what we should be moving towards. First of all, he says, I want you, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Did you catch that? Jesus didn't say, go and make converts. He didn't say, hey, hey, just get a checklist so you can check off how many people go to your church now. He says, go and make disciples. In other words, he says, I need you to engage an intentional relationship. You've got to understand, Jesus' discipleship program was a three-year program. It was three years, and then he left. <laughs> We've got to do a better job of saying, you know what, Lord, I'm going to do intentional relationships with people. I'm going to go and actually make disciples. That takes time because when you're moving, it's not aimless. Our mission isn't aimless. It's not mindless, but it's intentional. Yes, yes. I want to intentionally go to other neighborhoods. I want to intentionally go to people. What does he say? Do it to all nations. That means that it's not just the people I like, right? Uh-oh. That means that it's not just the people I share blood with. That means that it's not just the people that look like me. That means that it's not just the people that share the same income bracket I do. He says all nations. And what he's saying is that you can't just tell them about this message. I need you to demonstrate this message to them. I need you to show the kingdom everywhere you go. Go and make disciples. We focus so much on the go, but we need to actually look and say, he also said make. That means we've got to build. It's intentional. Next piece, he said We've got to move the kingdom of God creatively. This one is hard because Jesus is baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Baptism was a symbol of new life. Baptism is a symbol of new life. And so what I want you to understand really quickly is you are not saved because you're baptized, but you're baptized because you're saved. Baptism is a symbol. It's a symbol that's pointed towards my faith in Christ. And so notice even in this text, and, and what we know in Christian tradition is that baptism would often happen when they were in the discipleship process. When somebody actually spent some time with them, when somebody actually gave them some, not when they were in the discipleship process. And so what I need you to understand is that baptism not attached to faith is just taking a bath. You're just taking a bath. And I'm, I'm not knocking your, your baptismal practice. This is just kind of, I want you to understand what he's saying here is that baptism was a symbol of I chose to live a new life. I'm choosing to live a new life. I am choosing something different. And so we celebrate baptisms. We celebrate people coming and, and being a new life. We, we dunk people in the water, in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. But what we're also doing when we dunk those people in the water is we're showing you that, hey, they are living a new life. 
And so Jesus is inviting us to do the same thing. That we need to baptize people in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. We need to show them what it's like to live a new life. This is a better way to live. So what I do when I, and what I want to be doing when I'm actually demonstrating the kingdom is everywhere I go, I want to show that there's a better way to live. In my marriage, I want to show that there's a better way to live. In my business, whatever my business is, I want to show that there's a better way to live. Whatever you're doing in your college, in your major, at your university, are you showing that there's a better way to live? There's a better way to live. What we do with baptism is we leverage all of our lives. We leverage all of our lives, everything we are, every, all of our giftings, all of our talents, everything we are, we leverage that to demonstrate the kingdom towards others. That's what mission is. The other thing is moving the kingdom wherever I am. So if mission is moving the kingdom towards others, I have to be moving the kingdom wherever I am. Here's what he says. I need you guys to teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. All right, Jesus, well, what was it that you commanded us to do? If you turn to Mark 12, 30, he tells us. They're asking them the same questions that we asked. What should we be doing, Jesus? Here's what he says. My command is very simple. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. There's no commandment greater than these. See, I need you to understand that wherever your feet go is your mission field. Your neighbor is who's ever next to you right now. Wherever your feet go is a mission field. That means your job becomes the mission field. That means your school becomes the mission field. That means your home becomes a mission field. Your children, even though we love and we, you know we bring them into church every single week, let's be honest, I'm, I'm just going to, I'm a parent, my, some of my kids don't know Jesus. And they need to be demonstrated the kingdom. They need to see grace. They need to see mercy. They need to see all of the things that the kingdom brings. Like, so what we do is that we need to be bringing the kingdom wherever we go. And I need to address this really quick that we are often looking for the sexy in mission. Sometimes we are always looking for the sexy in mission. Like, how can I go and serve at a place that's really sexy? So when I take pictures, it's like, yo, this is like, I'm really helping these people. I'm really serving these folks. And Jesus is saying, I need you to love your neighbor. I need you to love your neighbor. Can we do that right? I love your neighbor. So like Jesus, I leverage all of my life. We leverage all of our life to move the kingdom towards others. I'm going to invite the band to come up um, in just a little bit, and I'll have you guys stand. But we're going we're gonna to land the plane in just a little bit. So we talked about the why. Why of mission is God moved towards us. The what of mission is he's invited us to move towards others. So we've got to understand that the how now is, is a little bit different. It's moving my life towards him. How do I do mission? It's by moving my life towards him. We've got to understand that we, we've got this great commission, and the great commission is I'm sending you off to do something. But that great commission is only, it's only relevant if we tie it back to Jesus' mission. And so Jesus' mission gives us the great commission, but in order for us to live out the great commission, we have to engage in the great submission. We have to engage in submission. So I move my life towards him. So here's some phrases that I, I've, been, I've been learning, and, and I'll show you this really quick. Uh, what, what, a, few, um, <laughs> a few months ago, I started this uh, jujitsu class. Now, don't ask me to show you anything I've learned. I've only taken like three classes. But in those three classes, I know a little something, right? But I was taking this jujitsu class, and <laughs> it was the craziest thing. I didn't know what I was doing. I really, I was terrible at it. Like, I was, and I'm this big guy just kind of being thrown around all over the place. Like, these, these guys knew what they were doing, and, and they were throwing me around and everything else. And it hurt, but it hurt really good. Like, it was one of those good feels. Like, oh, man, okay, I'm learning. But what didn't feel too good is uh, there was this girl, like this 15-year-old girl. <laughs> she was about, <laughs> she was about five foot nothing, real skinny. And, I, and I, I hate to admit to you guys, but she had put me in a chokehold. So I'm like, I'm literally falling from a 15-year-old girl. 
So I went and I tried this on the sensei. I watched the girl do it, so I'm going to try it myself. I go to the sensei, and I try to do this move, and I'm, like, doing all of the stuff he shows me how to do. And he's like, James, what are you doing? I said... <laughs> I said to him, I'm just trying to, you know what I mean? Like, I'm trying to hurt you. Like, I'm, I'm trying to do this. <laughs> he says, your problem, James, is that you're too tense. He says, jujitsu is called the gentle way. And the only way you're going to be able to do these movements is if you just surrender. Is if you actually go in gently. And I think that sometimes with mission, we make it so complicated. We make it so complicated. I'm just going to force my way in here. I'm just going to do another program. I'm just going to do another thing. I'm just going to do, do, do. And, and that's not what Jesus is inviting us to do here. He says, I'm inviting you to surrender. I'm inviting you to surrender. Here's what you got to understand, that this is not just some great commandment. But if we get the message of this, if we're not just focused on the letter of this text, but we're focused on the heart of it, that Jesus actually chose us, that he moved towards us. It compels us to move. It compels me to move. And let me give you these phrases I said I would give you. The one that I've been trying to live by, these are three that you can take with you today. I try to live by these phrases. This is how I try to remind myself that the Holy Spirit is with me, that Jesus says, surely I'll be with you to the end of the age. And this is how I remind myself. Number one, this is what Jesus did. He says, if I got it, you got it. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, therefore go. In other words, Jesus says, I've got all of this stuff on lock. I've done everything I need to do. And so because I have it, I'm giving it to you. What does that mean for our personal lives? If I got it, you got it. That happened to me recently. If I, I was broken down, somebody said, hey, I got an extra bedroom. You got it. Practical stuff. It's also, if I got it, you got it. If I've got this freedom in Christ, then you got it too. I'm going to show you every time I go to my family uh, a gathering. If I've got grace, I want to make sure I'm showing that too. If I got it, you got it. Number two, I'll be the one. I'll be the one. If I got it, you got it. Number two is I'll be the one. Jesus says, hey, I actually need to step down from heaven. I need to step down from the comfort of being with my father because there's nobody else who's going to save you right now. So I'll step in. I'll create a powerful intervention to let you know that you don't have to live this way anymore. I'll be the one. Jesus says, I'll be the one. Could we say the same thing in our daily lives? I'll be the one. When I walk into the grocery store, maybe I'll be the one to put down my phone and engage the cashier. I I'll be the one. That when everything is kind of you know, going crazy around me, that I'll have the nerve to actually look someone in the eyes and engage them. That I'll have a, the nerve to actually look someone. I'll be the one. And number three is this. Just reminding myself daily that I'm a kingdom ambassador. Straight up and down. I'm a, I'm a kingdom ambassador. That means that the results are not up to me. All I'm doing is demonstrating the kingdom wherever I go. I wear the garment of praise wherever I go. Well, all, I, all I'm doing is, is I, I just operate in this oil of joy wherever I go. Everything that the kingdom represents is what I want to take with me everywhere I go. I'm a kingdom ambassador. It's my rightful place. It's your rightful place, church, that we are kingdom ambassadors. This is not just some commandment that you've got to do this, and if you don't do it this way, you're, you're going to hell. This is saying, Jesus is saying, I'm inviting you into something so much greater. I'm inviting you into a life you can't even imagine. Because what we don't understand is that when we start to move towards others, we start to move towards God. And if we can move towards God, we become a little bit more like Jesus. Our life is a lot more fulfilling. Amen. Can you stand on your feet? I'm going to invite our prayer partners to come on up. And, I, and as our prayer partners are coming up, I want to end with this. That Jesus said something so significant. And I know this is for us. Pastor Bardo in San Antonio, uh, man, that, that dude is just so anointed. Pastor Bardo, like, he just speaks, and it's like, man, just shifts things. So we'll, we'll be meeting for sermon prep, and we'll have all this great revelation, and then Pastor Bardo gets on for the last five minutes, and he just wrecks us all. And so here's what Pastor Bardo said. He says, you know, James, oh, he said to the rest of us, he says, you know, that the Satan, another name for Satan, is the accuser. And he says when you kind of unpack that word, the accuser, just a little bit, what you find is that at the heart of accuser is category. The root of accuser is the word category. 
And so the reason that you and I don't engage in this life that Jesus invites us into is because for most of us, we put ourselves in categories. I'm not enough. The category, I don't have what it takes. The category, I'm only a college student. The category, I'm only a single mom. The category, I'm only this. I only have that. But Jesus says, I actually want to break the category. Listen to what he says. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. I've wiped out all the categories. It all belongs to me. And now I'm sending you out. I'm commissioning you. So you have the authority today. And whenever the devil tells you you're not enough, tell him that's okay because Jesus is. Hey, yeah, this ain't me. This is not, the results are not up to me. I just submit. Don't be like me. Don't be like you can get choked out by a 15-year-old. Just submit, submit. So today, I believe that Jesus is inviting us. He's commissioning us. He's sending us out. But before he sends us out, he moves towards us. And I believe Jesus is moving towards us today. If you have come here and this is your first time, you know, being at church, your first time hearing about this Jesus thing, and you're saying, you know what, I've never, I've never experienced the love of this God you're talking about. I, I don't know what that means. I don't know how this works. If that's you, and you're saying, you know what, but today, I know he's moved towards me, and I want to move towards him. If that's you, would you raise your hand? If you're online, you can raise your hand as well. And I'm not, I'm not doing this to, to try to get you to stir up and say something. I see you in the back. Amen. Amen. Move towards. And so here's what I want to do as well. If you see that there was a hand raised, I want you to move towards them. I want you to go and pray for them. Maybe today you're sitting here or standing here and you're wondering, Lord, I, I, I've got some situations. I, I know you're calling me to some stuff, but I don't know if I, 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 I'm in a category right now. Would you move towards some of our prayer partners so they can speak the love of Jesus over you? If that's you today, and maybe, maybe you just need to be co confirmed on your calling. Let, just move towards today. Make some movement today. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much that you moved towards us, that you knew exactly what you were doing, that nothing stopped you from your mission. Nothing stopped you, no demon in hell, no scheme of man, nothing stopped you from your mission. You ran after us with open arms, Father. Thank you for running after us when we didn't have the answers, when we didn't know what to say, when we didn't have the right scriptures, when we didn't know what to pray. You ran towards us. And God, we're so grateful that you're running towards us, you're moving towards us today. Have your way, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. For I took a breath, you breathed your life. You have been so, so kind to me.
you say? There's no wall? Come on, raise that a little louder. Say, There's no shadow. Come on, if you believe it, say there's no wall. Come on, let's declare that together. If you believe, say there's no shadow.
believe I'm not going back. Oh, here to declare, yeah. In you. Now I know it's about that time to go, and I promise I'm we getting ready to get out of here. But when somebody gives me something new, I can't help but say thank you. We got time today. Turn to somebody and say, I got time for a praise today. I don't know about you, but when somebody gives me something new, I can't help but say thank you. I can't help but give God praise for the newness of my future. So together as a family, if you believe that you're going forward and you're going to spread the mission of the Lord, somebody take a moment and give the Lord praise. Sunday morning. Y'all ain't really believing God to spring up something brand new in your life. If you did, you give a big shout of praise right now. If you actually believe. service prayer the fact is this is that when you have said yes to Jesus let me just real quick any moment of time you said yes to Jesus you may have fallen off you may be struggling you may be dealing with something you may be feeling like you're less than you may be feeling like grace has escaped you let me tell you something the moment you said yes he placed all of who he is on the inside of you so at the right time when you need it you can say, God, spring up within me what's already there. It may have been a lot dormant, but it's already there. It's already there. Spring up joy. Spring up peace. Spring up patience. Spring up your goodness. Spring up favor. Spring it up, God. Spring it up like a well. Like a well spring that never runs dry. Amen? Amen? Spring it up. Hallelujah. 
We go to a whole other church service. I'm telling you right now. Spring it up. I feel like, you know, today with the message that we had and the, and, the, and the challenge and the mandate, the call that God has on us, I just feel like just the Lord wants to set the record straight that nobody in here is unqualified or disqualified, that you have a, a position in the body of Christ, therefore you have a purpose in the body of Christ, and you can go out and be the hands and feet of Christ in this room as well as outside this room. Don't let the enemy, don't let the accuser tell you otherwise. You are free in Christ. Amen, somebody. You are free. Stop. Listen. Let's do this. I want to get through this real quick, and we'll see where God wants to take us. Hey, a couple quick things. The announcements. We have our community expo that's happening next uh, weekend. This is powerful because if you want to partner with us and getting connected in a lot of the different initiatives we have going on outside of just our weekend services, the different organizations we're with, that's going to be happening immediately following service next weekend in the gym. So check that out. Also, baptisms. If you've never been baptized before and you want to get baptized, please sign up to get baptized. We would love to celebrate that with you. We don't take baptism lightly around here. It's not just about getting wet for Jesus. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about dead to sin, alive in Christ. It's a public display of what's happening on the inside. So sign up today. We would love to get you guys connected on that. And then, okay, and then last but not least, Overflow Night. It's back in 2020. And so uh, Overflow Night is a night of worship, of prayer, and as, as well as activating the gifts of the Spirit. So we truly believe uh, that that night we're going to set aside some time to just stir up the atmosphere and see what God says. We believe for miracle signs and wonders that night. We believe for the prophetic word of the Lord that night, that the Lord would just activate something. So if you're like, hey, I love that. I want to be there. Come to that. If you're nervous about it, come anyway. It's like, you trust us. We're good to go, right? We're not going to lay you out and throw you on the floor or anything like that. No, no, no. That's not how we do. So uh, but, but come. It's going to be a great night. Uh, fellowship and as well if you have children we want to encourage you to sign them up we want to make sure that we can prepare our children's ministry with the right amount of volunteers that night so sign them up so we can make sure that uh, we're ready for them and then you can have your time in service that night last but not least actually two things two hands raised online say yes to Jesus today the internet's being used for the glory of God hallelujah and then last but not least, if you are new, we've, we've had a lot of first-time guests today, and it's beautiful. I want to first off say on behalf of our senior pastor and our leadership here, welcome home. Thanks for coming and choosing to be hanging out with us today. But before you leave, please stop by our information station out there. We have a free gift we want to give you. Just saying thank you for hanging out with us in any way that we can connect with you. Uh, again, stop by out there. We'll give you that gift before you leave, and you can head on now. Uh, and then if you have children, go pick them up. And again, we got to get ready for our Ivy Memorial family real fast. we got about three minutes real quick. Let's pray and see what the Lord wants to do as we get ready to end this service. Amen. Father, we thank you for your presence in this place, God. Lord, we thank you that you are just so good and so real and so true. Father, we don't try to run from this moment too quickly or escape this moment too quickly. God, we just thank you that you are good, that you chose us, God, that we are in these pews and in this service, all because you said, I have a divine plan for him. I have a divine plan for her, and no devil in hell is going to stop that plan. No enemy, no lie, nothing. Lord, we thank you that today, Today is a new day. We shall rejoice and be glad in it, God. And so we thank you for all these things. Now bless us as we leave here. Let your presence go with us, God. And let us have an incredible week. In Jesus' name we pray. Somebody shout amen. God bless you guys. Come get some prayer if you want. We'll see y'all next week. We love y'all.
Hey, Freedom Life Church family, I'm excited to share something with you today. Over the past few years, God has done some incredible things here at Freedom Life Church. And one of the reasons is your giving. You have given of your time, you have given in prayer, and you have contributed financially. Well, we wanted to enhance that and make it even easier for you. So we've established a text to give feature. And it's as simple as that. On your phone, you text this number, 1-855-440-4064 and the amount you desire to give and send. It's as easy as that. Now there are a few locations that you can give to. If you simply give an amount to that number, it'll go to our general fund. But if you want to give of your tithe, you would type tithe and the amount you desire to give and send. We also have an expansion fund that if you want to give to that, just type expand and the number that you desire to give and send. We're really excited to see how this new feature can continue to enhance our partnership and to see what God does in furthering this ministry in the kingdom. So on behalf of Freedom Life Church, we thank you, we love you, and we're excited to see what God's going to do. God bless.